Hello and welcome back to the studio. In this video we'll be having a look at camera settings in much more detail. So this is suited to those of you that already know your way around a camera quite well and you just want more insight into how things work and exactly where things come from. Or you're a madman who's completely new to cameras and you just want an intense crash course. Yeah, you're right. It won't be so hard. But if you want full creative control over your image and want to know exactly how things work, then you're in the right place. This does mean that we're going to be going into quite a lot of depth and a lot of detail. So if you just want to skip to a certain topic, then all of the time codes are just here. The main things we're going to be looking at are frame rate, shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. I had to think about that then. Hopefully by the end of this video, you'll know exactly what those things mean and how they work. Let's start with the first one, frame rate. Now your frame rate can be described as the number of still images, that's frames, captured for every second of your video. Here's the first video ever captured in 1877. This was actually captured by separate cameras, each taking an individual image and then playing them one after the other. This right here is in 12 frames per second and incidentally 12 is roughly the number of frames that you need every second to even perceive motion. Frame rates changed quite a bit after this in each production, up until the standardization of projection speed in the 1930s. Before this, the most common frame rate used was around 16 frames a second, and it's this 16 frames a second that gives most silent movies their really iconic movement. When projection speed was standardized between 1926 and 1930, the frame rate that was settled on for the most cinematic look was 24 frames a second, and that's the standard that we still use today. You should have an option to shoot in 24 frames a second on your camera, but don't worry if you don't. Some companies have been guilty of leaving this out of certain cameras recently. <coughs> if you don't have an option for 24p, don't worry too much. You should be able to get 25 if you change your camera from NTSC format to PAL. Most people won't even be able to tell the difference between 24 and 25 anyway. You might also have noticed that there are other options for higher frame rates like 60 frames a second or even 120 depending on your camera and these are just mainly used creatively for slow motion shots. Let's use a little bit of maths here. If we shoot in 60 frames a second you should see that we can slow that footage down by two and a half times and get back to our original 24 frames a second. Similarly you can shoot in 120 frames a second and slow this down by five times to get back to that original 24 and maintain that realistic movement. And speaking of movement, that leads us on to the next setting we have control over, which is shutter speed. Shutter speed is what gives the movement in your footage motion blur. Now, a hard and fast rule for this is that your shutter speed should be double your frame rate. Let's use our standard 24 frames a second as an example. Now, if I select this in camera, I want the shutter speed now to be as close to 48 as possible. And the closest option we have here is 50. This means the shutter will be open for 1 50th of a second. If we're shooting slow motion at 120 frames a second, then we want our shutter speed to be as close to 240 as possible. And the closest that you'll probably have in your camera is 250. If you follow this rule, you should always get really natural looking motion blur. And if you want to know why, then carry on watching, but this does get quite technical. Now, this comes from the early days of cinema when cameras used a rotary shutter instead of a curtain shutter that you get in most modern cameras. These cameras used a semicircular disc to either cover or expose the film when you were shooting. And the most realistic shutter angle they found was about 180 degrees. You can see this in action with this useful little animation here. Now with that 180 degree shutter angle, this means that for each frame of that film, it's exposed for half of the time. 
In other words, each frame is exposed for 1 48th of a second, making the shutter speed twice as fast. This might seem a little pointless to know now, but if you ever use a cinema camera in the future, all modern cinema cameras still use shutter angle as an option. I hope you're still following. You might be asking, what happens if you don't follow this as a rule? What does that do? All this means is that your motion blur will look unrealistic. So if you use a faster shutter speed or smaller shutter angle, then it's just gonna give you less motion blur in that footage. The motion will look quite jittery, similar to the effect you get from stop motion footage. With a longer shutter speed or larger shutter angle, you just get more motion blur in that footage. These can both be used creatively, of course. Cinematographers often shoot war scenes with a faster shutter speed to make it seem more jittery, to offer more detail to those shots. In fact, you're probably so accustomed to watching war films like Saving Private Ryan with those smaller shutter angles that if you saw it with more motion blur, it would probably look less realistic. This is probably the next most important thing you need to look at when setting up your camera. The aperture is basically how large or small the opening is through which light travels to hit your sensor. This is measured in f-stops, and the first confusing thing you'll probably notice is the smaller the f-stop number becomes, the larger or wider the aperture becomes. Bear with me. Aperture affects the image in two main ways. Obviously, if you're opening up the aperture to let more light in, the brighter the image will become, but it also affects your depth of field. A wider lens will give it a shallower depth of field. This gives this blurry effect to the background that we call bokeh. If we increase the f-stops, you'll notice that the distance between focused objects increases, giving us a deeper depth of field. Keep in mind how these two things work together. If you're shooting in a dark environment, for example, and need to let as much light in as possible, you're gonna open up the aperture. Now, as well as letting more light in, you're also gonna be creating a shallower depth of field. And this might cause you issues, for example, when you're focusing. Okay, are we ready for my next little nerd tangent? Remember, if you wanna skip this bit and go straight to where I start talking about ISO, you can skip to this timestamp here. Nerd! So why does the f-stop number get smaller when you make the opening in the lens bigger? Well, the f-stop is actually the ratio between the focal length and the diameter of the entrance pupil. As you can see, the focal length of the lens affects the aperture. This is why some zoom lenses have an aperture range rather than just one value. Because as you start zooming in and out, you're gonna be changing how much light is hit in the sensor. You can get around this with more complex optics, which allow you to change the focal length without changing the aperture. An example of this is like with this lens here, which is the 70 to 200. Actually, this is, looks a lot bigger than it is. <laughs> That's what she said. This is a 70 to 200. Uh, f2.8 and this means that if you're shooting at 70 or 200 it doesn't matter you can shoot at 2.8 all the way through now the downside of these more complex optics is that these lenses can be multiple times more expensive than other zoom lenses you might also have noticed another aspect of this formula which explains why wider angle lenses usually have a lower f-stop number now let's use a 50 millimeter as an example this is a f1.4. Now, if we wanted an f1.4, but in a 100 millimeter lens, now using this formula, you can see to get that same f1.4, the diameter of the entrance pupil needs to be twice as big. Shall I go into the science behind depth of field? I think we'll save depth of field for now before this just becomes a dry physics video. But for now, just know that depth of field mainly comes down to something called the circle of confusion. And apart from sounding like a Pokemon attack, this is also just down to the lens optics and how they work. <laughs> Lastly, let's talk about ISO. The ISO can just be thought of as the sensor's sensitivity to light. So what does this mean for the image? Well, basically, the higher you push the ISO number, the brighter the image will become when the sensor is exposed to the same amount of light. And most cameras have an ISO range which starts at about 100 and goes all the way up to 25,000 or higher than that. 
We can see this here when shooting wide open at f2.8. It's still too dark and the scene is still underexposed. Because of the rule around shutter speed that we learned earlier, we know we can't change anything else to let any more light in, so now we're going to have to bump up the ISO. This is currently at ISO 100, so let's start cranking it up. You can see as it gets higher and higher, the image becomes more evenly exposed, but you might also have noticed something else which comes into play at high ISO settings, and that's noise. You can see that although we can see the image now, we now have this grainy effect which makes it look quite bad. This is something to keep in mind when shooting in low light. Most modern cameras will give you perfectly usable footage at 3200 or even 6400 ISO, but you should avoid pushing your camera to these high ISOs unless you know that your camera is specifically designed for it. I shoot most of my footage at ISO 400. Now you might be thinking, why shoot at 400 when you just said the higher you push the number, the more noise you get. Surely ISO 100 or the lowest you can shoot in would be the best possible option. Well, this leads me onto the final little nerd tangent, and that's how your ISO settings affect your dynamic range. So what is dynamic range? Dynamic range is just a measure of how much detail is preserved in the highlights and the shadows of the image. This is actually something that you pick up on quite a lot when you're looking at an image. It's quite important to the overall quality. It's something that modern TVs are picking up on now. It's become quite a buzzword when they say that TVs are 4K HDR. The HDR just stands for high dynamic range. Dynamic range is measured in stops. The more stops of dynamic range your camera has, it means the more detail it can preserve across the exposure. So it means there's going to be more detail before the highlights start to clip and before the shadows start to be crushed. So what does all this have to do with ISO? Well, changing your camera's ISO settings will change where those stops of dynamic range are actually utilized. Let's use this diagram as an example. Now this is for the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera specifically, uh, but I've used this one because it, it's quite a good diagram and quite a good example. You should check what base ISO your camera has, and if you've got access to any of this information, it's always worth looking up. So you can see that this camera has roughly 13 stops of dynamic range, but if you're shooting at ISO 100, roughly 11 stops of those 13 are used in the shadows. But if we're shooting a scene outside with lots of detail in the highlights, like in the clouds for example, we know that we're going to want to use a lot of those stops in those highlights. So in this diagram here you can see as we start to boost up that ISO setting, we can start to utilize more of those dynamic range stops in the highlights. So in this example, it makes more sense to shoot in a higher ISO and then counter that change in exposure with a change in our aperture or by using an ND filter. This is why I shoot most of my stuff in ISO 400, because I know for the main camera I use, which is the Canon 5D Mark IV, it offers me the best dynamic range in both the shadows and the highlights. Since we're on this tangent, I'll also briefly explain where ISO comes from. You've probably guessed it, it's the film days. For most 35mm film, for example, the ISO was determined during the manufacturing process. Now, a common ISO that they used to use was ISO 121 film, and the last number nowadays when we're referring to ISOs is just dropped, so it's ISO 100. I think that pretty much covers it for today. You should have a pretty comprehensive understanding of your camera settings now, and there's always plenty more we can go into in the future if you're interested. As always, if you've got any questions about anything or need any other help, then get in touch through Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Or if you need anything else, just go to mgmstudios.co.uk.